Happy Mother's Day. The poet Helen Steiner Rice said it well about a mother's love when she wrote this. A mother's love is something that no one can explain. It is made of deep devotion and of sacrifice and pain. It is endless and unselfish and enduring, come what may. For nothing can destroy it or take that love away. It is patient and forgiving when all others are forsaking. And it never fails or falters, even though the heart is breaking. It believes beyond believing when the world around condemns. And it glows with all the beauty of the rarest, brightest gems. It is far beyond defining. It defies all explanation. And it still remains a secret like the mysteries of creation. A many-splendored miracle man cannot understand. And another wondrous evidence of God's tender guiding hand. The founder of uh, Mother's Day was Anna Jarvis, who spent 40 years developing that concept and her drive to create that day found its fulfillment under President Woodrow Wilson in 1914. And Anna had some fears, and they were well-founded. She feared that Mother's Day might be exploited by the florist industry, the card industry, the restaurant industry, the telephone industry, and it has been. <laughs> but yet, we still take advantage of those flowers and cards and phone calls and taking mom out to eat because she's worthy and we want to show how we love her. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 15 in just a moment. We all owe a debt of gratitude to Anna Jarvis who came up with the idea of Mother's Day. But in Matthew 15, there's a Gentile mother who came to Jesus with a problem. And she couldn't solve this problem herself. And she had heard about Jesus and that he was passing through. And she went there to meet him. And she was ready to humble herself and to grasp for words and a way and faith to make a connection with Jesus so he could help her with her problem. She wanted to connect, and she did. And she needed, and she pleaded, and she succeeded. To say that her problem was just an ordinary problem would be to understate her problem tremendously. And we'll see that in the text. Let's read in Matthew 15 and verse number 21. Matthew 15, verse 21. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meat to take the children's bread, and cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Can we pray together? Father, we pray that you'd bless us Help us to learn from this lady, this mother who came to Jesus with a very great problem. And Lord, help us to see some truths that would be beneficial in our own lives today. And we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we read in our text about a very interesting and unique mother. And her, 
her, her motherhood, her plight, and even problems, every mother can relate to. We, we have problems, don't we, people? <laughs> mothers have problems. As wonderful and as great as mothers are, they're like everybody else. They have problems. And this woman, this mother, was in a predicament, but she approached Jesus appropriately, and she got help for her problem. And her predicament might prove to be useful to all of us today. Let's take a few minutes to see what we can learn from this Canaanite mother. Number one, she had a problem. She had a problem. Verse 21 says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon, up in the northwest part of the country of Israel. And it also says that when he went there, in verse 21, or verse 22, and behold, a woman of, of Canaan, now this was a Gentile woman. She was a Canaanite woman. She wasn't a Jew. She was of a mixed race. And she came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. And she tells about her daughter being vexed with a devil. That would be a pretty serious problem, don't you think? And this is what Jesus found was a woman with a problem when he's in this area. And mothers everywhere have problems. I, <coughs> I heard about the mother that had three, three children, and those children gave her a lot of trouble. And somebody asked her, said, uh, if you had to do over again, would you still have children? She said, yes, but not the same ones. <laughs> kind of, mothers, you probably felt that way before. Mothers are very special people in their lives. A junior high science teacher uh, lectured on the properties of magnets. And he gave a quiz the next day after he lectured on the properties of a magnet. And he gave a quiz the next day and asked the students, he said, tell me who I am. My name starts with an M and I pick up things. Half of the students wrote down mother. <laughs> well, that's what you do, isn't it, Mom? <laughs> you pick up things among a thousand other things. I read about the woman who tele telephoned her friend, and she said, I I've just had a terrible day. She said, uh, she said I my head's splitting. I've got this awful headache. My legs and back are killing me. The, ki the kids have been terrible today. The house is a mess. And the lady on the other end of the line said, uh, very sympathetically, she said, well, why don't, I, why don't I just run over there and you just lie down and rest, take a nap, and I'll clean up your house for you. And uh, she said, by the way, how's your husband Jim doing? The lady said, I don't have a husband Jim. She said, oh, <laughs> wrong number. The lady on the other end is having all the problems. Paused for a minute. She said, well, are you still coming over to clean up my house? <laughs> That's what we want, isn't it? Well, in any city, you can pick up a phone, call, a phone and call a mother in any city in America, and you can find out she's got some problems. And this woman in verse 22 had problems. She said, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Now, one thing about mothers, they know things. They know things. And kids, <laughs> teenagers, those mothers know usually either specifically or generally what's going on in your life. They just know. They have that extra sense. Uh, my wife, I always thought she had eyes in the back of her head, but I think she's got more than that. Man, she just knows. She's, <laughs> mothers know things. And this mother knew something. She knew what was going on with her dog, daughter. And a wise mother knows what this mother knew, that there is a devil, number one. 
There is a devil, and as we heard in the Sunday school class this morning, not only is there a devil, but number two, the devil is out to destroy your kids. There is a devil. I know the comedians make fun of of the thought of a devil, but the Bible says that there is a devil, and he has a lot of sub-devils that are going around at his command trying to ruin your children. And this mother knew her daughter had a devil that was trying to ruin her. The devil is after your kids. And this mother recognized that. If you, mother, knew something or someone was trying to destroy your kids, you would want to protect them, wouldn't you? That's what mothers do. Well, the devil is attacking our kids today in our world. in in America, in our state, and in Searcy. The devil is attacking kids. I see it all the time. I grew up, and several of you grew up in a time when things were somewhat different. And maybe the devil has got more of an upper hand today than he had before. The Bible says that he's the God of this world. Now, the God of the universe is in control of everything, and the devil of this world can't do anything without his permission. But there is a devil who is running loose, and he wants to destroy your kids. That's why he will get your kids involved in immorality. He'll get your kids involved in substance abuse. He'll get your kids involved in being just aloof from the family. Listen, mothers, when we let our kids become aloof and they don't, they don't realize that they belong to a family unit, We've heard the the saying from the liberals that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, we don't believe it takes a... We kind of do believe it takes a village, but we believe that village is very small and it's called a family. (laughs) And the family is what raises the child. And that child ought to grow up thinking that I'm part of this family. That's why you give them chores and that's why you pray with them and that's why you see that they're protected from the evils of this world. That's what mothers do. I have a rose bush at home. When we moved there 20 some odd years ago, uh, there was this beautiful wild rose. It has those little pink roses about that big. And we admired it every spring. We'd see those blossoms. And then somehow it, it was in a fence row and the privet hedges and the briars had grown up in that fence row. And for the last a couple of years, we haven't seen those roses. I told my wife, I said, I wonder if that rose bush is still alive. She said, well, it probably is, but it's grown up where we can't see it. Well, this back in the winter when everything's kind of di- died down, I went down and took the loppers and trimmed out a bunch of those briars and privet hedges. And now those pretty blossoms are showing this spring. The devil is like a thorn in your flesh. The devil is like a briar. And when the devil has his way without... Uh, mom and dad protecting that child, the devil will put the briars up all around the beautiful rose that is your daughter or your son. And the devil will choke out that beauty that could be seen. And that's why parents are protective to make sure the devil is not getting control. Our kids, when they were small, we we wanted to protect them. Now when when I was uh, a lost man, just living like the rest of the world, having a good time, partying, <laughs> I didn't have much interest in what was going on in our kids' lives. And they were, they were being indoctrinated in the government school system, and that was back in the 80s. And I got saved. And I heard preaching on the fact that, that the government is indoctrinating your kids and the culture around them is like the briars gl- growing up around those beautiful children that you have. And we took our kids and put them in the Christian school because we wanted to protect them. And my wife was behind me 100%. She said, that's what we need to do. And so we put them in a Christian school. Do you think the government's indoctrination system has gotten any better in the last 40 years? <laughs> I don't think so either. And I admire all those mothers who have, who have the, the guts, the stamina, the wherewithal to homeschool those kids or put them in a Christian school where they don't get indoctrinated and the briars of the devil grow up around them. Thank God for those who 
love their kids. This woman in our text had a problem. And the problems are many. I mean, we could spend the next uh, several hours talking about how many problems kids face today that they didn't face maybe when you and I were teenagers or smaller. They got, they've gotten worse. This woman had a problem, but also she had a plan. Look at verse 22. Behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. You know, mothers today, a lot of times mothers don't know. Listen, mothers today a lot of times don't know what to do when they have a problem. They may run to the doctor or to the pharmacist or to the psychologist. And, and I'm not saying all of those things don't have a place in life. But the first place we ought to run is to the Lord. <laughs> this woman had a plan. She didn't go to the liquor store. She went to where she heard Jesus was going to be crossing near her. And she showed up where Jesus was going to be. I love it when mothers show up at church. I, I see mothers that have problems and they say, boy, I don't know the answer to this problem, but I believe the Bible has the answer. I believe God has given the answer. And if I go there, maybe I'll hear, maybe I'll meet with Jesus there today. Do you come with that expectation when you come to church? Do you come expecting to meet Jesus somehow, somewhere, in some way while you're at church? I come to church, I want the Lord to speak to me. I don't come to church to look for something to be offended about. I don't come to church to look for something that I can, or somebody that I can be mad about. I don't come to church just to be social. I don't come to church just because it's Sunday. I come to church because mainly I want to meet with the Lord. And thank God for mothers who show up at church because they want to meet with the Lord. This lady showed up where Jesus was going to be. The little boy was being bad to his mother. She said, son, you're going to be the death of me. She said, every time you worry me and bother me like you have been, you make another one of my hairs and my head turn gray. He looked at her and said, well, you must have been a pretty bad child. She said, why do you think that? He said, all of grandma, grandma's hairs are gray. <laughs> well... I don't know if it works that way or not, but sometimes we feel like it does. Some, some mothers have problems. They don't know what to do with them. They keep those problems for life, and they die with them. Can I just tell you, Jesus didn't mean for you to have to put up with the same problem over and over again. If you bring it to him, he wants to give you help with it. Yeah. She understood. This woman, this Canaanite mother, she understood that she needed to come to Jesus. Not just check in once in a while, but she needed him to do something big for her. She came with tears. Mothers oftentimes shed tears for those kids, and rightly so. If your heart is breaking and your heart is yearning for that child, maybe it's a wayward child, maybe it's a child that you just want to see grow up to be a servant of the Lord, a good citizen, a good person. A lot of times a mother prays at night when nobody knows. A lot of times that mother's shedding tears. My mother did. Bless her heart. She, she shed a lot of tears and prayed a lot of nights while this jerk was out being a bum. She prayed not only that would God save me, but that God would use me in his service. And I'll never forget the day when I surrendered to preach. She was just she was brimming over with joy. She said, son, I knew you was going to get saved because I asked the Lord all the time you were growing up and all the time you were doing all those bad things, I was praying for you and I knew the Lord was going to save you. And I knew the Lord was going to use you one day because I prayed for you. Mothers pray and they shed tears. This woman came to Jesus shedding tears. She's saying, oh Lord, have mercy. She was serious. She came in humility. She didn't come saying, Lord, you need to help me because you know I, I did go to church last Sunday. You owe me something. <laughs> she didn't come to Jesus and say, Lord, I paid my tithe. I gave last week. You owe me something. Well, she didn't come saying that. She didn't say, Lord, I talk about you so you owe me something. 
No, she didn't say that. She just come and said, Lord, I've got a problem. My daughter has a devil. Lord, have mercy on me. She didn't come arrogant. She didn't come demanding. She came, she came with tears and pleading and in humility. She came and she essentially was praying to Jesus. She said, Lord, have mercy on me. Unlike so many today, she knew how to come to the Lord. She had a problem. She had a plan. And number three, she had a provider. She had a provider. She had somebody who could do what she needed to have done. She couldn't solve this problem on her own, but she came to the one who could. She had a provider. Look in verse number 28. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Evidently, the Lord healed her at that moment and later the disciples and Jesus must have got a report back saying, yep, she was healed. <laughs> Jesus can do miracles. Jesus can do miracles. Sometimes mothers need a miracle. You've got a problem that just requires something big that, that we can't do. But we know the one who can. She had to overcome some things. Listen to me. It's not pie in the sky thing. The Lord knew she was serious because she came to him and she said, she said, Lord, I've got a problem. I need some mercy. You know what Jesus did? He didn't speak. <laughs> Whoa. How cruel. How irresponsible. No. She had to overcome his silence. There's five things you need to do when God seems to be silent. First of all, examine your life. See if there's something wrong in your life that needs to be fixed. Secondly, accept God's authority in your life. You know, sometimes God gives you directions, and if you say, no, I don't like that one, I'm going to look for another one. <laughs> That's not accepting God's authority. God makes some things very plain that He expects you to do. God expects you to be in church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much more as you see the day approaching. We're supposed to gather together. That's one of those things. You don't have to pray about it. Just accept God's authority. He meant for us to meet together at church. And everybody said? Amen. <laughs> God meant for us to be givers. God meant for us to give to His work. And so we don't have to pray about it. We just need to do it. Examine your life. Accept God's authority. You know, when Job, remember old Job? <clears throat> he, had some, he had some very bad things to happen. He lost his family. He lost his possessions. And his wife, <laughs> this is what not to do, mothers. His wife said, well, so much for worshiping God. Why don't you just curse God and die? Thank goodness he didn't take her advice. <laughs> he said, uh, no, no. <laughs> No, though he slay me. In verse, uh, chapter 13 and verse 15 of Job, he said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He said, God can do whatever he wants to do because he's the one in charge. God's the one in charge. Jesus didn't answer this woman that came to her with a vexed daughter, vexed with a devil. Jesus was silent. She had to overcome that silence when God is silent. Sometimes you pray and it's like the ceiling is brass. You can't seem to get through. Does that mean God doesn't care? No. Does it mean that God can't hear? No. Does it mean that God is cruel and just He's good to some people and not others? No. What do we do when God is silent? Examine our life, see if everything's right on our end of things. Second, accept God's authority. He may have you ready to take a step that you're not willing to take. And thirdly, listen to what God is saying. Listen for the, God, the voice of God. The Bible says that it was a still, small voice that came to Elijah. A still, small voice. Sometimes... <clears throat> 
Listen, we think, we think God ought to thunder out of heaven and give us answers and rain money down out of heaven and work miracles out just because we said a quick prayer. When God spoke to Elijah, he spoke in a still, small voice. What's our responsibility? To listen. <laughs> to listen. Don't do all the talking in your prayer time. Listen sometimes. Because we're asking God for things, we probably need to listen to see if He's saying anything. When God is silent, listen. And then realize that silence can be an intimate experience. Jesus wasn't ignoring her. Jesus wasn't being cruel to her. This brought her closer to Him. Sometimes when God, you don't hear the voice of God, it might be that he's drawing you closer to him. That's what's happening with this woman. We're going to see her have successful answers and solutions to her problem in just a little bit. When, when Lazarus died, remember Mary and Martha sent, sent a message to Jesus, come, our brother is sick. He's really sick and he needs you, Lord. What did the Lord do? Did he just trot over there immediately and heal him? No. What, what did Jesus do? The Bible says he just stayed where he's at. <laughs> Lazarus died. Well, see, Jesus was cruel, wasn't he? No, he was bringing them closer because they had some faith in Jesus already, but he knew by waiting and then he'd go and raise Lazarus from the dead out of that grave, that would increase their faith and they'd be drawn closer to him. You know why God lets problems come into your life sometimes and you know why he seems to be silent? Because he's trying to draw you closer. So he seems to be ignoring this woman, but he's not. Oswald Chambers said, when you cannot hear God, you will find that he has trusted you in the most intimate way possible with absolute silence, not the silence of despair, but one of pleasure because he saw that you could withstand an even bigger revelation. What do you do when God is silent? Number five, keep talking to God. Keep on talking. Keep on talking. Did this woman just ask him one time and say, well, I guess that's it, and she left? <laughs> no, she said, Lord, have mercy on me. He didn't say anything. She kept asking. She said, Lord, I need your help. <laughs> I think God admires that when we don't give up on our prayers. Psalm 22, verse 2 says, Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, and am not silent. She had to overcome the silence of Jesus. She kept asking. And she had to overcome the disciples' rudeness. They said, Lord, <laughs> this woman just keeps on crying after us. Well, in the first place, they wasn't crying. she wasn't crying after the disciples. She was crying after Jesus. They got a little bit of the big head there thinking, boy, we're pretty important. She's crying after us. She was crying after Jesus. And they said, we ain't got time to fool with you. Woman, get away. The Lord's got important business to do. He has no more important business than to take care of this mother. She had to overcome their rudeness. You know, she could have been offended and said, well, that's... Last time I'm going to that church, <laughs> preacher didn't even shake my hand. <laughs> oh, wait, did you come to see about the preacher or did you come to see Jesus? <laughs> there are, there's some of the members there that are not very friendly. Well, it could be that they're just really shy. They ought not to be. They ought to be outgoing and welcome people. But if you quit serving God just because somebody didn't shake your hand, was you really looking for Jesus in the first place? People get offended over the slightest little things. It's, it's him that we're looking for. And she had to overcome her own ignorance. She called him, Lord, thou son of David. Well, now Jesus explained to her, in this, in this dispensation, still in the dispensation of, uh, of Israel being dealt with, the Old Testament dispensation until Jesus died on the cross. And so... 
she's, she calls him son of David and, and she's kind of trying to horn in on the Jews. Uh, the, uh, the gospel, the good news was to be preached to Israel first, to the Jews first, and then to the Gentiles. And she was kind of getting, she was kind of getting in a hurry uh, thinking that she ought to be one of the Israelites but she was a Syrophoenician woman, a Gentile. That doesn't mean that God never blessed Gentiles in the Old Testament dispensation. She came humbly. He said, I can't, I can't give meat to the dogs, referring to the Gentiles as dogs. He said, I'm, I'm called to the house of Israel. Did she quit then? No, she said, well, he, he said, he, he kind of called her a dog. <laughs> Some people are offended at what, what Baptist preachers say sometimes. Look at what Jesus said. <laughs> he said, I can't be giving the meat to the dogs. You know what? She, she didn't say, I'm not a dog, I'll have you know. No, she didn't say that. You know what she said? Truth, Lord. <laughs> the Gentiles had rejected God a long time ago. She said, truth, Lord, yet even the dogs are able to scarf up some of the crumbs that fall from the, de- from the Lord's table. You know how he responded to that? He was impressed with her importunity. She wasn't going to give up. She believed that he was the one to do what she needed to have her problem solved. She was Humble in it. I, I love to see, I love to see mothers who are humble and not arrogant. I, I know someone, uh, all of you got some of these on Facebook, right? I got a, one mother that's a friend uh, on Facebook. She's always posting things that's kind of in your face. I'll rake you over the coals. I've got a chip on my shoulder and I dare you to knock it off. (laughs) She's that kind of a mother. I don't think Jesus is impressed with that. I don't think he would have been impressed with this woman if she would come with that attitude, chip on her shoulder. She didn't argue with the Lord. She said, yeah, Lord, you're right. (laughs) A dog I am. Arf, arf. (laughs) Yet even the dogs get a few crumbs. He said, I admire your faith, woman. I admire your faith. Verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. He said, I'm going to give you what you ask. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. This mother was in a stark, dark predicament. It may be similar to wars that mothers fight today. In fact, everybody finds themselves in a swarm of difficulties. And when we try to fight our way out of those wars on our own without calling on Him, we're fighting losing battle. Do you need a miracle today? Do you need salvation today? Look, let let me pause right here and just address something that I see. I try to preach the gospel in every message before we dismiss. I try to make it plain that a soul is saved not by what good things you do. You cannot do enough good things to get you into heaven. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if we could do enough good things to get to heaven, we wouldn't need Jesus. And God said, I'm not going to let you boast. (laughs) If you want to get saved, you've got to do it my way. Jesus said, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus came as a sacrifice. L- listen, look here. And folks online watching, you don't get saved by the good things you do. Neither do you go to hell because you did so many bad things. One sin will send you to hell as fast as a thousand bad things. A sinner is a sinner. Those who have done wrong deserve hell according to the Bible. 
For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. There are none righteous. Not one. See, everybody's a sinner. And everybody's in the same boat. When you're born, you're born with a sinful nature. And because of that sinful nature, you will do things that are wrong. Everybody does. But you don't have to go to hell. Now here's the key. The key to getting into heaven is not giving up the bad things that you are doing because you could never go back and give up the things you've already done. You're still guilty of those. The only way to be saved is you have to have a substitute. Someone who never sinned. Listen to me. Someone who never sinned, and there's only been one, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, lived a perfect life, never having sinned one time. He didn't have to die for his own sins. He died for yours and mine. And because he was the perfect Son of God, he became your sacrifice on the cross of Calvary because he loved you. He died for you. And you can never say, well, I got saved because I went to the Baptist church. No, that doesn't save anybody. You can never say, listen, you can never say, I got saved because I got in this water. No, sir. <laughs> the water saves nobody. It's the blood, the blood of Jesus that saves souls. It's not by being in a denomination. It's not by reading your Bible. It's not by your eloquent prayers. It's not because of who you know or what family you were born into. There's only one way to be saved, and that's when you come humbly like this woman and say, Lord, I am a sinner, and I deserve hell. But I believe you died for me, and I'm accepting you as my substitute, my Savior. Listen... When did, you, when did you get married? If you got married, you weren't married when you got engaged. You weren't married when you started dating. You weren't married when you went to the church house to sign your vows. When did you get married? You got married when you stood before the officiant and he said, will you have this man and will you have that woman? And you said, I do. That, when he said, I now pronounce you man and wife. You said, I do, and he pronounced you man and wife. That's the moment you got married. Now, when you get saved, it's much the same way. When you realize you're a sinner, and Jesus says, I'll save you because I died in your place. The moment you say, I do, he pronounces you saved. It happens at one instant. You can't go to church enough years to become saved, but you can... Ask the Lord to be your Savior. Trust Him as your Savior. And He'll save you at that particular moment. I can't save anybody. Connor can't save anybody. Lloyd can't save anybody. We can tell you how to be saved. We can point you to the one in heaven who can save. But it's when you place your heart in His hand. You say, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I want to be saved because of what Jesus did for me. The cross... When Jesus died on the cross, he purchased your salvation. Have you been to the cross? Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless in this invitation time. And Lord, I pray that if there's a mother who needs a miracle, there's a mother who needs a solution to a problem, if there's a person in this room today who needs a Savior, I pray that they'd come to this altar today and trust you. And Lord, they'd place their faith in you to give the solution that only you can give. I pray that you'd bless. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Would you please stand with me? Our